Last time we looked at the certainty of judgment with passages like Matthew 25 and Romans 14 and uh, 2 Corinthians 5 where the judgment of Christ includes the sheep and the goats and that the apostle by the Holy Spirit said we shall stand uh, before the judgment seat of Christ. And so today we're going to look at some of the categories of judgment. And uh, Tyler, today we start with uh, one of the most dangerous categories, and that is our words. Um, and so uh, Matthew 12, 36 and 37. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. All right. So idle words. Okay. And... We could go into this in a lot more detail, uh, but what you say. So when you hear, and I, and I know you've heard people, oh, I'm just saying that. Really? Well, those, those might be included in idle words. Idle words within the context are words that disagree with what God's truth is. They had said that the Holy Spirit was the devil. And uh, Jesus says that these things come out of the heart and that you'll give account for your words. And so, you know, have you found yourself disagreeing with the word of God and giving voice to it? Well, those are idle words. You're going to answer for it on dead judgment. Um, have you said that certain biblical truths don't matter so that you could vote for a politician that you liked because you liked their policies and your conscience convicted you, but, oh, you decide to speak contrary to the word of God so you could vote whatever you felt like. And, and you told other people, well, those are idle words. Idle doesn't mean like little kids, you know, going, hey, diddle, diddle, the cat and the fiddle, right? No, that, no, that's not idle words. Idle words is, you know, um, the one that I, the one that just grates on me. We need a little more Jesus and a little less Paul. And I'm like, okay, those are idle words because you think there's a difference between Jesus and Paul, number one. Number two, the Holy Spirit who inspired the apostles and prophets to record the Gospels is the same Holy Spirit that inspired the rest of the New Testament. And so maybe you're watching and you've said, well, we need to not take that part of what the apostle says too seriously because it's just culture. Um, no, I give you a prime example of something that I know is just cultural. You've been, you've read the book of Ruth, right? Yes, sir. Right. So when it says, you know, he took off his shoe and he gave it as a pledge because that's how they did pledges back then. Mm -hmm. That's cultural because when the person wrote it, they were like, yeah, they just apparently back in the day, they took off their shoe as proof that they were going to keep their word. Okay. Well, all that stuff is idle words. All that stuff is idle words. When you find yourself disagreeing with the scripture and speaking it, you're going to answer for that. Um, he said, no, no, you've, you've not heard me disagree with the scripture. You heard me say, I wish this wasn't in here, but because it is, it is what it is. And we, we have to deal with it for what it says. No, no, no. The whole thing. And when your words coming out your mouth disagree with this, those are out of words. So that'd be, that'd be one category. Uh, let's look at a second category. Uh, we looked at in the last session, but 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. All right. So our deeds. We have to answer for our deeds. Okay. Uh, and then 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Now, to me, it's interesting, 5, 10, and 10, 5. Okay. Casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. All right. And then go on ahead with six. And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. All right. He said, yeah, thoughts. 
thoughts. What we think, what we say, what we do. Those are the three categories. You say, well, that takes in everything, Brian. Correct. Correct. Um, if all sin proceeds from the heart, sinful words and sinful actions, uh, and I mean, we can go to James 1. All right. Flip over James 1. And we'll see what James has to say there. Verse uh, 12 and 13, Tyler. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Go through 15. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Now this is an interesting one. Temptation starts where? In the thought, in the mind, in the heart. Okay. Where does where does it you know? Uh, it says you know drawn away of our own lust. There's usually a physical inducement external to us, but it has to take fruit and take hold in the mind, in the thoughts. Then lust, when it's conceived, when it's finished percolating. In the mind, now sin can come out of it. And so the thoughts, the thoughts, big deal. Uh, so what is some of the stuff that's going to pertain to Christian judgment? Well, and, and I said we come back to uh, Revelation 20, but right now let's go 1 Corinthians 3. All right. Verse 11 through 17, Tyler. For no one foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Do not do you not know that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. All right, so some different things going on here. First of all, uh, he's not talking uh, necessarily about gold, silver, precious stones in the sense of building church buildings out of those things he's talking about the quality of your works the quality of your works when paul writes uh, to the thessalonians i believe it is that might have been timothy he'll say you know that in in every house there are vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor vessels of gold and vessels of clay and then he tells the people what you have to pick well, the gold and the clay, he's contrasting the kinds of people. Well, same thing here. Your works. Frankly, some of your works are valuable. Some of your works are basically worthless. And what does he say? Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day. What day? The day of judgment. Shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. Meaning... Your works are going to go through a process of purification at the final judgment. You say, well, brother, what if I don't, don't have very many works? Well, the fire will try your work to prove what it is. If any man's work abides, which he has built upon, he receives a reward. Some of your works are going to bless you going into eternity. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Some of your works ain't going to make it. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now, whoa. People don't like this. Here's part of the other purpose of final judgment. Okay. I'm just going to speak for myself, but, you know, if you, if you agree, by all means, join in. 
my sins were forgiven the last time I sought his forgiveness. Last time I said, Lord, I've sinned against you, I failed you, wash me in the blood of Jesus and make me clean again. Those sins are gone. As far as the sense of there's nothing between me and the Lord. But here's the problem. What's in my heart? What's in my heart? Well, I, I'm forgiven for that. Uh-huh. But let me ask you. Uh, have you gotten upset at anybody in traffic in the last 90 days, Tyler? Yes. Have you thought thoughts that you knew were wrong thoughts? Yes. So have I. Chances are, so have you. Um, we won't ask about the main forms of lust, lest people put themselves back in a place of lust by thinking about them. Okay? But there's my point. What does it take for you to go to a not good place in your heart and in your mind? You're not pure but i'm forgiven yeah but you're not pure you haven't been purified tyler do you know what the greek word for fire is pure yeah the greek word for fire is pure our english word pure and the word purification come from the Greek word for fire, which is pure. The process of purification is one of the purposes of final judgment. Your works are tried, and you're tried by fire. Let's go back over to uh, Gospel of Mark. Gospel of Mark, chapter... <coughs> uh, da, 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 da. <clears throat> you remember which chapter it is, Tyler? Which one? Is it? Salted with salt. Oh. The worm dieth not, and their fire shall not be quenched. There we go. Chapter 9. Okay. And we're not going to read the whole thing. Okay. Um, you alright? Mm hmm. We're waiting in chapter 9. Okay. So, right, he's talking about being cast into hellfire. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, where the worm does not die, the fire is not quenched, verse 48. Mm -hmm. Now go on ahead and read verse 49 and verse 50. For everyone will be seasoned with fire, and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Salt is good, but if, a, if the salt loses its flavor, how will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. All right. Everyone shall be salted with fire. Not just everyone that's going to hell, but everyone shall be salted with fire. Now, all those sermons by all those happy preachers that try and make sermons that, you know, people, oh, that makes me feel whatever. Right? Whenever they talk about salt, they say, salt has a purifying quality. Uh-huh. Ham and bacon. One of the biggest qualities of ham and bacon, cured ham, cured bacon, is salt. salt. Mm -hmm. But you know what? You couldn't eat old school bacon that had been cured with salt. There's a reason why that meat was cut up. Did you ever have pork and beans as a kid? No, sir. Okay. For those of us who are old enough to remember pork and beans... What was always in it? A chunk of pork fat that was salted. That was what was in the beans. And that goes way back. But that chunk of salted pork that had been, that had been purified and cured, you put that in to give it the flavor of the pork and the nutritive value of the salt. That's how people used to cook back in the day. He said, what does that have to do with this? Because Jesus was Jewish and he didn't eat pork. Yeah, I know that. Point is, if salt has a purifying factor, listen to what he said. Everyone shall be salted with fire. The salt that purifies 
is the fire. And then he says, every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Well, all of our works to the Lord are technically what, Tyler? We bring the blank of blank of praise. Offerings. We bring the offering or the sacrifice of praise. Didn't we just read in 1 Corinthians 3 that all of our works, all of our sacrifices shall be tested or proved with fire? So we will be salted with fire and all of our works will be salted with the salt of fire. And then when Jesus says, he says, salt's good, but if salt loses its flavor, how are you going to season it again? He ain't talking about salt. Then he says, have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. Have your own purifying fire within. If you lose the fire, how will you be relit? If you lose that which purifies you, how will you be pure? And it's a fair question. This is what people miss about quench not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in John, in the Revelation, appears as what? Seven spirits of God, which, you know, appear as flame and they also appear as eyes. And so again, it's for purification. It's for purification. Then go 1 John 3, that this, this point about purifying, right? You have a choice. You have a choice. 1 John 3. All right. And go on ahead. Read 1 through 3, Tyler. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is, uh, just as he is pure. Now, wait a second. Who purifies us? We do. Mm -hmm. But you have a choice. You can purify yourself, or he will purify you at the final judgment. And I want you to see the book of Hebrews... This theme is picked up, and most preachers like to say, most preachers ain't going to talk about this, because people don't like to hear this. Okay? Um, Hebrews 12 and verse 14, Tyler. You said Hebrews 12, 14? Yep. Um, Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. All right. And then, 23, 12, 23. Well, do, do 22 and 23, make more sense. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to Beth, no, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. All right. Which are written in heaven. New King James has, which are registered, which are written is better because we're going to see that same concept of written uh, in Revelation 20 again. But we're in the general assembly, the church of the firstborn, which is what? The place of the spirits of just men made perfect. Well, he tells us that without following peace and holiness, we aren't going to see the Lord. That sounds just like what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the pure. Do what? Pure in heart. Yeah, pure in heart. For why? For they shall see God. They shall see God. Pure. Pure. You say, no. This is what nobody likes to hear. All right? And, and there will be someone that will accuse me of being a Roman Catholic now. All right? So for a long time, the Roman Catholic Church said what? When you die, you go to purgatory. And everybody's like, there's not an extra place outside of hell. Well, that tells me you didn't understand what the Catholic meant by purgatory, number one. Number two, the Catholic doctrine of purgatory isn't quite what the Bible teaches about the process of purification. 
but the word purgatory, what's the first four letters of purgatory, Tyler? P-U-R-G. P-U-R-G, which if I add an E to that, spells what? Purge. Purge. A laboratory, an oratory, any of those Tories, not the English kind, okay, but the working kind. Purgatory is a place of purging, a place of purification. That's all the word means. You and I have to be made pure before we can enter into the new heaven and the new earth. When we give an account for what we've said, what we've done, what we've thought, we still have to deal with what's in our hearts. And Jesus Christ, by the fire of his holiness, will finish purifying us. I say it this way. You can pick a different way to say it. It don't matter to me. Jesus Christ will finish burning up all of your impurities. See, you confuse. So many people confuse the impurity in your heart with the actual commission of sin. But he says in Revelation that when we get to heaven, Tyler, mm -hmm. will there be any sin in heaven? No. But if sinful men who have impure hearts get into heaven, right? If there's not a final purification because somehow forgiveness makes everything pure, mm -hmm. then how would heaven work? It wouldn't. It wouldn't. Read me 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you there's three phrases there. And those three phrases tell you that forgiveness does not equal purification. But if you reach a place of purification, consistently, you can reach a place where you won't sin anymore in that area of your life. Go ahead, Tyler. Uh, you said verse... 6, six 9 through 11. Okay. So let's start with verse 9. Uh, do you not know that the unrighteousness... The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You were washed. You were made clean of your past sins. Now you're no longer dirty. Problem is you'll get dirty again. You were sanctified. Once you were made clean, you were set apart for a special purpose and function for God. Sanctification. And then the third category was what, Tyler? Third one was... You've been washed, you've been sanctified, and... Justified, right? Justified. All right. Now, that TV show, Justified, ain't got nothing to do with justification. Nope. Okay. In fact, that TV show is the opposite of justification. All right. I'll take your word for it. I've never seen it. Yeah, I watched one season. That was enough. Uh, it, yeah, no, that was enough. Um, justification is a legal change in status. It's where you move from being a sinner to being a saint, where you move from being a child of the devil to a child of God. Okay. Three things happen, though. Not one. Three. Washing is forgiveness of sins. Your purification in this life, the word sanctification, what's another word for sanctify, Tyler? Purify? No. Um, the other one starts with an H. Sanctify yourselves to the Lord because the Lord is blank. Holy? Holy. Sanctification and holiness go together. Okay? But you can't maintain holiness unless you also pursue purification. It's the only way it works. And so one of the purposes, after you have given an account, and next session we'll touch on, on, on why you give an account. Okay? But part of Christian judgment is purification because most people, their hearts aren't where they could enter into heaven without committing sin again. 
Other thoughts, Tyler? No, sir. All right. <laughs> Excuse me. With that, I'm Brian Reagan. This is Tyler Kelly. And uh, Tyler is excited about this topic, um, but he ate two white chocolate macadamia nut cookies. Three. Three. And uh, had some starchy vegetables. Goodness gracious. Some with. Uh, and carbs. Yeah. Carbs. Yeah, some starchy carb loaded vegetables and, and a little bit of protein before we came in. So he is having carb crash. <laughs> Quite badly. <laughs> uh, whereas I went heavy protein and light carbs until right before we cut, started to cut the video. And I only ate half of that slice of pecan pie before we started. Swap so, man. I am. Now I see it over there. Now I don't blame you. Yes. <laughs> so with that, I'm Brian Reagan. This is Tyler Kelly. And we bid you a good day.